Hello and welcome to the Max MPS Radio. My name is Jan Frisse and today I'm honored to have Brad Freeman on the podcast, um, who just recently uh, won his title in the Bantamweights at WMBF Worlds. Um, so he is a pro natural bodybuilder and a coach by himself. So uh, I'm really excited to have you on, Brad, and um, I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Thank you for having me. Uh, so my name's Brett Freeman. I'm a WMBF pro bodybuilder. I just turned 30. I am getting married next year, so I'm currently engaged. I have a stepson who's nine. Congress, man. Uh, thank you. I, my other career besides uh, online coaching is I'm an assistant banquet manager at a hotel slash golf course that specializes in wedding events. So I'm on my feet all day, constantly catering to guests. Probably was was a fine thing in prep, right? Being on feet. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I it was like, it was a yeah. It was a plus in the beginning. Yeah. And I mean, you're constantly around food, but then again, mm. on the flip side, you're not really food focused at all because you're you're so used to seeing that food all the time. So uh, you were actually pretty uh, adjusted to the to the big step count, right? De yeah, definitely. I, I utilized step count towards in, in favor of cardio. Because I yeah. was hitting anywhere from 10 to 20,000 steps a day. Makes sense. Um, do you think, just, just like a real uh, quick question that, I, that came to my mind, do you think that the not being food focused was actually a thing of you being around food all the time? Or actually just the experience from the previous preps and that people tend to have less problems with food folks at all from prep to prep? I think you, you get better at... Um, adjusting to food focus the more preps you do but i also think being around food and the constant smell of it it kind of gets old plus surrounding yourself with it constantly it definitely plays a part cool that and that and i think look i mean looking at looking and viewing food looking at food uh while prepping with a different state of mind as well kind of helps you cool as in, um, yeah. as in meal structure and yeah, it makes sense. Um, and I mean, I, I can just assume how it actually was for you because I was pretty much not around food because I'm working from home and yeah. you can kind of isolate yourself pretty good in prep when you actually be an online coach, like in terms of just not being around food and uh, constantly seeing things and smelling things and stuff like that. Yep. And I, and I've been there too. I've, I've done prep while not i mean while working part-time so i i was uh, i was home more so you're constantly thinking of oh when's my next meal oh, oh i wonder what i can fit into my macros mm -hmm. you know during this meal and the, I, I feel like being busy helps tremendously while prepping absolutely absolutely i mean yeah. just staying busy i mean you've probably Same. noticed it yourself yeah. if the, the more busy you are the less fixated you do become on food yeah, I mean, you basically don't have time to think about food or time to think about eating more. And yep. what I've also found, like, was for me, there was just no way I could ever not hit my macros. Like, I had the goal and the tunnel vision at some point. I was basically, for me, me meals were fine. I had fun while eating them. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong, but it was basically like, when the food is gone, it's gone time for work or whatever yeah, exactly, or go train. Exactly. yeah. and that's yeah. the number one question i do get asked is like how, how are you so adherent to your your dieting like how do you not go with macros yeah it's like i don't i've never understood binging during prep or going over mm. macros i mean everything yeah. if with the goal in mind it's like there's i'm not even going to go a gram over i will take that last yeah. two cheerios yeah. out to hit you know the <laughs> basically 56 me, grand. yeah basically me or prep long and i think that's I mean, it, there's it's it's a two two blades word because at some point some people probably stress it out to to uh, fit your macros on the gram. Um, some people probably stress it out to not do it, and it was actually the the last. Um, so um, it, it, as long as you don't have that kind of like tick going into your off season, um, because when I when I transitioned to my improvement season or to my recovery diet, I was straight getting back to plus minus 20 on everything or plus minus 20 to 10, uh, 10 for fats, 20 for protein carbs. And I had no problems doing that. Yeah. Did you have range? You, you had ranges or did you have 
uh, I had ranges in my recovery <coughs> process, but in prep, okay. I was, I mean, I had macros and um, my coach actually gave me ranges and they were pretty small. I think Valentin uh, does like plus minus five on carbs and throats and three on fats, I think, but I was okay. pr spot on every day for That's like yeah. basically when we start working the whole process through. So, um, and I look at that, that is like one of the variables that you can control. So why not control it to its full extent since we're not huge guys? We're yeah. kind of banking on conditioning, so. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, just the whole not being that, um, ha not having really the problem uh, with the prep is not really the diet. Um, actually got better from just experiencing diet, dieting. Um, because I was doing, I think, two to three pretty long diets in my life and before the prep, like four to six months. And yeah. I got some really good experience from those times um, that actually then transitioned into my prep and being a lot easier. So, Which I think is definitely needed before you hop into a full contest prep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, I mean, if four to six months to some is a full contest prep, but I kind of yeah. look at that as more like a diet before the diet. Mm. Experiencing some of the side effects that do uh, come along with a deficit, you know, fatigue, lethargy, yeah. and... Yeah, I mean, for I think for exper more experienced people, or especially, um, or at least for me, um, and a lot of people that I talk to that I, uh, have more experience, the problem is not really the hunger or the appetite or the food, but rather it's just the managing the rest of your life in terms of just yep. being lethargic and not having energy and stuff like that, doing work, doing yep. housework and stuff like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it get shit gets hard, like. For real. I actually get more tedious and meticulous in regards to cleaning the house and doing dishes when I am prepping. Same with laundry. Like I'm constantly clean. I don't know. It's during the off, during the off improvement season. I'm more laid back. Whereas like prep, it's like everything's got to be clean. Got to keep moving. Got to do this. Yeah, do yeah. that. <laughs> I, I developed some pretty insane routines and systems. Like just every step was pretty much like the same every day. <laughs> Like I did notice that it, I did notice yeah. that it worked though. Like my with my, my neat did start decreasing because I was I was noticing in my head I was thinking, what is the easiest way to perform this task but still be efficient about it? Yeah, and it's funny looking back on it. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I mean I I think it helped <clears throat> um, at least for me like just developing like habits, especially with stuff that you. Like you, I mean, you're pretty neutral about it probably. I mean, for example, cleaning my kitchen, I don't really like it. I don't really not like it because I'm, if I not do it, my kitchen just is a mess and that's <laughs> terrible. Yeah. Um, but in prep, like stuff that usually is neutral to you gets like, um, you don't really want to do it. But if you are in a habit of doing it just every evening, for me, it was the thing I actually did before I went to the bathroom, then after to, to the bed was just cleaning my kitchen. And that was kind of like my evening routine or night routine and really... Uh, and then it becomes automatic yeah. and habitual yeah. in nature. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you just do it. Yep. Um, With yeah. no thought. <laughs> so cool. Um, Brad, let's actually dive. I mean, I'm really enjoying it. So just just okay. like a back and forth uh, discussion. But um, we have some um, topics that I picked out. Um, basically we will go into the recovery process. Then I, we will a little, talk a little bit about your nutritional approach in the off season or okay. the, the season or the, 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 um, the season that you're currently in. And I actually want to uh, dive more into your recent frequency experiment that you uh, do. Um, so do. I'm just really quick. Um, can you just to tell the people how your 2019 season <coughs> actually went? Um, yeah. Do you want me to start from the full just summary briefly? Just do like a summary and then maybe uh, highlight the highlights, like words Shall, and okay. the, 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 the pro contest before. Okay. So uh, my contest prep lasted about 11 months. It wasn't fully planned out as most do. Hmm. I ended up competing in August at the Max Hype Show with Jeff Alberts and Sam. I did not display that great of a physique in my opinion but i kind of use it as a uh debut up. slash qualifier warm-up yeah. for worlds because that that was the end goal towards you know the 2019 season i ended up returning to 
the show in September that I won my pro card at in 2017, mainly to see how I stacked up against uh, Garino Mackey, who is Iron Lord on Instagram. Phenomenal, yeah. phenomenal lightweight physique. Oh, super nice guy, man. He's Yeah, he's incredibly humble. Really, yeah, really cool absolutely. dude. Yeah. Monster. Monster work ethic, too. And then afterwards, uh, seeing how I stacked up against Garino, I ended up hiring Cliff Wilson about four to six weeks out from WMBF Worlds. Reason mm -hmm. being is because I wanted to completely clichely empty the tank. I didn't want to leave any, you know, could I have been better? Could I have gotten more conditioned? I, I didn't feel personally I was able to make that executive decision, self-coaching myself, just with this decision fatigue and constantly debating what to do macro-wise and cardio-wise. I, I just wanted somebody to, to take the keys pretty much. So prep ended up, uh, Cliff ended up prepping the last four to six weeks. I thought we brought the best package to date. I competed at WMBF Worlds. I took the lightweight class. I had the bandweight class. Sorry. <laughs> and yeah, it was a hell of a season in all honesty. Yeah. I mean, words was great. It was a fantastic day. We're really, really it was, long, but it was very, very cool. Long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, man, it was such an inspiration. Like just, I mean, I follow you for quite a bit. Um, and it was really, really cool to actually then finally meet you and seeing you on stage. Um, I remember talking to, to you about prejudging and just telling you that you actually will win your class and then you just did it. Uh, yeah, was and cool. it was, yeah. yeah. I actually just got sent a prejudging video that actually has H, it's HD quality. So it's nice mm. being able to look back and reflect because I haven't looked at pics, honestly. But okay. I, know a lot of, I know a lot of people do. They go back and they, they assess how they looked and how they stacked up. And it's... <laughs> Oh, that was a crazy lineup of bandweights. Yeah. That yeah. was an insane e class. Even the amateurs were super pretty the, yeah, guys. The entire st the entire world, because I was I yeah. was able to spectate after prejudging every single mm -hmm. class, amateurs. It was quality. Yeah. Definitely absolutely. world's level. Yeah. Um, I think <clears throat> from just looking at your pictures post prep, I think for me it helped to just get like a few weeks in to uh, being kind of like normalized and getting like a normalized body image again, like or at yep. least normal, more normal. I mean, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. We, we probably screwed for a few months uh, post prep because you, if you actually see yourself really, really lean for once, the way you actually see yourself in the improvement season is somewhat screwed for some amount of time for probably pretty individual, uh, but for a lot of people, I, I think. And no, definitely. It even yeah. happens to me. It's, it's just a huge uh, psychological mind f. It because the body weight on the way down when you're dieting, the, mm. you know, this, when yeah. you're pushing back up post contest prep, it, it looks worse. It always yeah. does. Yeah. Like 155 looks incredibly yeah. worse first coming down. And I, I experienced the same thing. I mean, I always used to look at you know Brian Whitaker and Alberto Nunez, mm. even Jeff Alberts, when you know. Pulse prep, they tend to hold their body composition relatively well and distribute fat uh, mm. better than I would say that I do because all of it, it, it's just so wacky with, you know, the water retention and where body fat does redistribute. It just looks bad, always. That's uh, how it's always I think, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at least in actually... my head, that's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, how yeah, I feel. Absolutely. Um, that, that's, that's probably me, um, like I can relate to that so much, uh, because I think, or from what I have seen, just lighter people, um, generally because they have less absolute amounts of muscle, yes. uh, the same body fat percentage, I mean, you can't really measure it anyways, but if you just hypothetically, hypothetically get like the person with the same body fat percentage, but the one has just more muscle, absolutely. Um, they will look different. And um, it's kind of interesting because a lot of band temps are actually don't really have a good off season look. And I think that's something no. that you have to accept because you at, at some point have to get at a certain point to actually get good progress in your improvement season. 
Um, agreed. So agreed. For for all the bantams out there who have a um, like bantams tend at least tend to have like a narrower bone structure. Yep. And if that's like um, combined with an uh, unfavorable body fat distribution, it, it usually doesn't really look that good. And no, I can never. totally relate to, yeah. that, to that. Yeah. I mean, I remember I saw your pre prep picture of you. I mean, <laughs> you were pretty, I think you were pretty, uh, you, you um, wrote that you were pretty heavy. Or that yes. you were pretty. Yep. But uh, that, heavy. It was yeah, needed. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, the the you were kind of. Um, I think you wrote that you will not push that far again. I think, was it was it? I don't. I think in terms of here, uh, funny thing about that. I don't think I'm gonna. I, in terms of pushing that far, I I meant in regards to body fat and body composition. Yeah. But I do I do think that body weight will look different uh, mm, when I yeah, do arrive absolutely. there. You want you want um, to get to the same body weight, but you obviously obviously want a better body uh, composition by then, um, with the yes. same body weight than pre prep. Yeah, yes. that's yeah, that's key. I think More pushing so like weight. Is, yeah, absolutely. So you don't want to get like the same body composition um, that you had pre prep. Correct. Yes, and gotcha. that was mainly that was mainly from lack of training as much, and also not mm. being as diligent uh, with uh, my nutrition. How long did you actually not train before prep or did you just start up with prep kind of funny? Um, so after 2017 worlds, I had yeah. a hot streak. The, the first six months I started, uh, I hired a coach, powerlifting coach, Brennan Tietz, and I, I was fixated on powerlifting kind of to take mm. that competitive edge. And then after the six months, after the six months, I didn't train for a good three to four months. So this is in between 2017 and 2019 worlds. So there was there was a about a three to four month layoff of training. So my improvement season from 2017 to 2019 was maybe a year and two months. So, in all honesty. But, but after those four months, you got back into training for probably a year, 2018. Uh, yes. Um, it, it would have been 2018. And it was from June to September, I didn't really train. And then from September to January 2019 is where I started gotcha. progressing again. And then yeah. I was right back in prep, which looking back on it, it was, a, it was a terrible improvement season. But I was able to make marginal gains, I would say, in improvements. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not, I mean, not the smartest just... approach. Just for everybody uh, who who has struggled with his uh, off season look, just uh, have a look at your Instagram or to to Brad's Instagram and check it out. It's really insane uh, what kind of physique you actually had under underneath. Um, that's that's a crazy transformation. Yeah. I was just <laughs> I was just like, what the what the hell is this? How can it would be possible? Hashtag transformation Tuesday. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's basically a really really good transformation Tuesday. So um, yeah, I mean coming actually to the recovery process, um, I would just be interested in uh, your approach post contest and uh, how did it go so far? And um, how do you do you actually feel completely recovered by now? Or and what variables do you actually look at? I actually felt recovered about two weeks afterwards in all honesty yes. i mean everything the, the only things that really took a nosedive were just uh intimacy and like my relationship with the fiance i mean food focus was never there lethargy was completely erased and eliminated about two weeks post show mm. and then i would say by the four to six week marker is when everything normalized it, it's another thing i was discussing last night just the small things that i would uh miss out on kind of or do as like a normal person have completely been reestablished um my my approach though as soon as i got off stage it was you know straight recovery diet i put away the food scale i ate off um hu hunger signals uh which i i did and i don't know if you saw but i ended up setting kind of like a default diet as eric yeah, Holmes saw that. was discussing yeah. so i <clears throat> Instead of you know falling back on my old habits of eating, 
which was complete flexible dieting and if it fits your macros, I set up not a set in stone, but I set up meal structures like from meals one to three and then like five to seven. They would be, you know, chicken, beef, vegetable, rice, potato based. And then my, my pre intro and post would remain the same. So I had, I had a general idea of how much I was consuming, but if I was hungry for, you know, a pop tart, I would have a pop tart. Hmm. There was, there was no restrictions. Thus there was no binging. There was, there was absolutely no binging post prep. And then I would say by weeks three to four, I, I started kind of getting an idea of how many calories I was consuming. Because I did notice that if I didn't eat enough during the day from intuitive eating, that my mood would directly reflect the next day. Yeah, man. And then the weigh-ins, I stopped weighing myself daily. It became more weekly. Then it became every uh, two weeks. I kept the hoodie on just to really not become fixated on what the mirror looked like, hmm. which I think is a huge, huge thing people should do. Just, just mainly focusing on how you're feeling in the gym, how your sleep is, your recovery, how you're actually interacting with you know your uh, significant other, your family, your coworkers. Yeah, it was yeah, it was a fun process. Honest, I mean, I it definitely parallels how 2017 was, which it took me about I would say four to six weeks in 2017 post recovery diet. So you, but it, it, it took a lot of force feeding in order to kind of arrive there. God, makes sense. Um, I mean, so probably from prep to prep, you the recovery process just got smaller in terms of like weeks you had to recover. Yes, definitely. Whereas 2009 and 2011, I tried reverse dieting to it was it was very bad. Can Terrible assume. experience. Yeah. Um, do you think you are hormonally completely recovered by the two weeks after post prep mark? Yes, actually, uh, I, I didn't really experience any libido loss or interesting. Yeah, or any negative hormonal effects while prepping. I don't know. I mean, same thing happened with 2017. There were no uh, libido loss, which mm. differs extremely to 2011 and 2009, where hormonally I was screwed yeah I'm, uns know. I'm unsure if there's i'm unsure if there's a correlation between being in prep and body fat set point but it not Maybe. too sure yeah Possibly. probably also just the experience in having less stripe uh, less stress throughout the diet yes definitely being less stressed out from prep to prep is probably also a huge point i mean for me i was pretty much making like significant like um or noticing significant improvement pretty much the whole first four weeks um, and actually try to intentionally gain um, I think there was a good percent per week so around nearly an kg a week um, and from there on it was just a much slower process and now by I think like week five or week six mark I can't really make and or can't really um, notice any improvements anymore but my libido is not where it was before. Um, I think so. I think hormonally, I still need more time. Like just mentally and f phys yeah. uh, physically, I think <laughs> I'm pretty fine right now. Like with like seven kgs out over stage weight, I'm, I'm pretty. Um, Which I think is, I think that's a good. I mean, that's a good spot. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, absolutely. No, definitely. I mean, it, it doesn't really look that good, and I tend to not look at me. Um, I do like check-in photos uh, every week for just being accountable on Instagram and sharing the process. Yes. Um, but it's like, ah, uh, you, it's just not, you, you tend to, I just do them and not really look at them that much. <laughs> and just so you're so, used, like, you're so uh, used to seeing yourself lean, whereas like full, not full off season, but your, your body composition isn't in the greatest. It, it'll stabilize yeah. obviously and, and yeah. harden up per se at this yeah. body weight. I, I'm still trying to. I'm still trying to gain weight. Uh, I'm in my improvement season. I will still gain weight. I will probably not. My. I mean, my goal is to get to. I mean, I was 80 kgs pre prep, and I was looking horrible. Um, <laughs> it's I was. Though, looking, I mean, <laughs> I was looking absolutely f not good, um, <laughs> and I will probably not push to 80 
again before I actually pull back a little bit. Uh, yeah. But I will at some point in my improvement season before the next prep obviously will hit 80 again. But then the goal is, uh, as you said, um, being in a better body composition at that same yes. body weight that I had pre prep is the goal. So um, I, I think it's pretty interesting that you put away the food scale completely. Um, and that I just still, shows. I still use it time to time, though. Time okay. to time. I, I will. Yeah, I, mean, I have. It, it shows your just pretty good relationships uh, relationship with food at that point in prep because probably a lot of people when they put away the scale they would just eat whatever and just completely yep. go all out um yep and i tend to really like the recovery process because uh, the recovery diet approach because you, you give people a lot of macros that they actually have to deal with mm. and i mean it's still it will probably not get you sane the first few weeks but it will get you a lot like it's worse than actually just overeating like uncontrollably so you're basically the, controlling your overeating um yes. and just yeah that that's i think that's a really good thing to do um, i think it allows you to know what being fully satiated actually is too i, I also mm. think like the recovery diet's a better vehicle transportation to arrive to actually just being full and hungry and developing a more healthy mindset towards food. Yeah. Whereas if you feel restricted still and you're, yeah, th that's, that's my biggest problem with reverse dieting is, you know, slowly bringing calories up in which you're never really full and you still feel like you're dieting. You still feel restricted and like mm. shackled and handcuffed. And I mean, I mean, even the recovery <clears throat> diet macros, like post post words, I mean, for me, at least, the first, especially in New York, when I was basically eating out every day, <laughs> um, it was it might it was a lot of food, but it was still kind of like you want more. Um, yeah. That's I mean that's a pretty individual thing. How long you have to actually do the recovery diet, um, and you just have to assess your variables, like especially like food focus, lethargy, training performance, libido, sleep, stress levels, whatever. Um, just like general well-being i guess yeah, um, yeah just a quick thing that came to my mind do you actually have some types of post prep blues post prep post prep blues like kind of like a mild depression or something funny you say funny you say that i actually just touched base on that on the revive uh stronger forums because cool. somebody asked me yeah I, I i didn't really experience it too much in 2017 and then 2019, like every, I mean, you know, you, I didn't really ride the high, so to speak, after mm -hmm. winning worlds because I yeah. don't really attach myself to placements. But right around week five of my improvement season, I entered week six of the uh, deload, which was around the holidays, so Christmas, Christmas Eve, and then New Year's, and I hit this like wall of depression almost. Hmm. Uh, it, it, in regards to, I would say, feeling empty almost. Hmm. And then, I, I mean, I started reflecting on uh, just the 2019 season and, like, where I'm going to go from now. Because it, it's very similar to how, what, I, what I talked about. I think it was with Sam Akinala in 2017. Like, I felt empty when I won. And I was wondering if, like, my training was good enough or where I'm going to go from here. And yeah, it's, I, I definitely, I, I'm coming out of it now, but I, I definitely hit like a one to two week period from like week six to seven of just, okay. yeah, questioning myself as an athlete, as a coach. And then I even, I, I, I uh, was talking with Eric Holmes last week about that in imposter syndrome and not feeling competent enough to really, uh, disclose information, you know, in regards to training, nutrition, on social media. Yeah, it's, it's strange looking, I mean, thinking about it, because I, I feel like every athlete does experience post-contest prep uh, blues. Hmm. Some just but they might not be vocal about happened. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, especially, I think, especially when you get into that, like, binge eating cycle, um, yeah. And you get like really, I mean, like 
binge eating by itself it's it's worse you just feel physically bad and you obviously look pretty screwed up um, but also the mental side of things like you you feel really really bad about yourself and it's just a repeating cycle and um, yes i think and that's I, I, I mean if, and but even if you have it under control and i didn't unintentionally um binged post prep ever i mean i had we had like a free day in new york where we basically just went out and ate what we want to uh, but that was intentionally. It was not like I just couldn't control myself or something like that. Yeah. And um, I think some people just have it more than others. And some people get it pretty, pretty bad, I think. Um, and they end up being yeah. pretty heavy, uh, pretty fast and not really feeling that great. Um, and for some people, that's maybe even the end of the career. Um, if they actually even had like a not so good um, season. Um, in terms of just like the mindset wise, maybe they, they didn't win the trophy that they want to. And uh, maybe, I don't know, just some thoughts that I had. No, I definitely, I do see that. I mean, if they don't have a good experience placement wise, and then they do tend up binging and then entering, you know, yeah. kind of post contest blues, they, it, that might be it for them hmm. because that, that, that'll be the last experience that they did have with the stage. And then the negative, you know, connotations that do come post-show if they don't get them under control i actually had that going back to my chain gym um because i was training in so such good gyms in in my prep and like post prep i was kind of like i don't want to go there i i mean i mean yeah. my motivation to train was not super high post prep to be honest um, same here yeah yeah honestly I, th I think and. I jumped the gun too much post-show in regards to... I mean, I did take a deload week after Worlds, but I do think I jumped into things a little too quickly. Yeah. And then it kind of fizzled out and burned. Yeah, it was kind of the same for me. I will probably... I mean, I'm now on my second mezzle, and I will probably do a third. And um, I kind of increased, like, just similar from mezzle to mezzle. Um, but after that, I pr probably do a proper maintenance phase for three to four weeks to really get myself, like... Reset. Just completely physically and mentally, like, reset. Yeah, reset and refreshed. That's, I mean, I noticed Jeff did that. Jeff did that, and it ended up panning out better, in my opinion, for him. Where I'm on, I think, on my second mezzo as well. So, same instance, I'm going to most likely enter a period of maintenance or lower volume. After that? Just, uh, yeah. After, yes. After my third mezzo, yeah, I believe. That's, that, yeah, that's my plan. That's my plan as well. I think, I mean, there's some rationale to do it uh, after prep, but for me, it was kind of like that five, uh, four week period um, of just doing four competitions back to back. Well, I was actually not yeah. really training that much. Um, so then had like two weeks of more normal training and then going into words being on like peak week training again. And I just jumped straight back into it. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I was feeling much, much better than like in peak prep before the first competition. I was wrecked. <laughs> I was. And I was uh, feeling better from peak to peak week, like from uh, peak week one to peak week four. Um, but to be honest, in, in retrospective, I should have probably trained through at least the first peak week, maybe even the second one, um, to actually conserve the look. Um, because four mm -hmm. peak weeks back to back with no real training, your physique tends to fade, especially if you uh, train, yeah. if you prepped um, as long as me. I mean, you did an insanely long prep as well. 11 months, you told? Yes. My, I think mine was 42 weeks, 40 to 42 weeks or something. So you even did a longer one than me. I, I didn't peak four shows in a row, though. That sounds incredibly... I, I, when, did you, when did you start your prep? In January? February. Um... I think it officially began, it was either February or March. I think March was when it started trickling into a prep. Because I, so I, maybe, was actually, I was actually starting in February. Or was it? I think it was February. Because it was, it was around my fiance's uh, birthday. It was after her birthday, actually. Which was the 18th. So mid... Mid-February. Mid yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean... We pretty much touched on the recovery process. 
and uh, since you actually yeah kind of recovered two weeks post post prep um we can dive in a little bit more into your nutrition right now um did did they did you change anything from the kind of like recovery process dieting to or diet to the off season to the full off season diet right now um not really no not much has changed i have noticed um food volume has come down a bit hmm. whereas i was i was um i was prepping sweet potatoes potatoes for main carb sources whereas now it's it's kind of shifted more <clears throat> towards availability and what's easier and to consume but i'm still you know i'm still hitting uh fruit and veggie re requirements that i've set for myself throughout the day along with making more adult decisions in regards to eating so i'm still eating you know chicken beef but i have noticed i am gearing more towards whey shakes i've gotten away from making sludge and gotten away from rice cakes which in my opinion is a huge huge plus instead of you know instead of uh, um how much food can i eat in order to you know become fully satiated it's funny because Back i my... just ate corn corn waffles with jam and uh with sugar reduced <laughs> jam and uh some away sludge it was no, just I, super I, fast super convenient i still I, I love sludge even during the off season like i love dipping you know food into sludge even putting it on bagels or yeah with fruit putting it over fruit man yeah it's so good it's so good <laughs> yeah I mean, food tend to be less fun or less just like pleasurable, but it's yes. still it's still good. I think. Um, I mean, pre prep, I was in a state where I was force feeding extremely. I will yeah, probably yeah, yeah. reach that point again, but right now, food is still okay. I will take it's that. It's enjoyable. Yeah, it's yeah. Any, I mean, it's everybody. It's a good state actually. It's a good oh, state yeah, yeah. where you're not where you're not be really food focused and you are fine with the meal. And after it, you just went on. Do you can yeah, you can put uh, but the plate you, still, down you still can easily eat your calories and yeah, enjoy your food. Yeah, definitely, and, and especially being able to like have a. I, I had my first slice of pizza for the first time all year last week. I think it was, and I took a bite, and I'm like, I, this is not as good as I remember it. And I finished it, and I'm like, I really don't want any more. Yeah, which is a was, which is a, was it's a great thing. <laughs> one day post words, we ate burger, pizza, ice cream, and there you go. <laughs> yeah it was good but i was also still enjoying a big portion of oats yep exactly and, and i just I had a frozen oats, yogurt yeah. half-baked bench everything that you have in the states that is great man it has like 12 <laughs> grams of fats or whatever <laughs> the um, ben and jerry's the ben and jerry's frozen yogurt oh, uh, half-baked it's, so it's so good it's like 12 grams of fat that's like a yep. freaking magnum ice cream that's nothing I actually have this frozen. It's a frozen uh, ice cream. It's a, fr it's a it's froyo, but it's ice cream. It's made by Hood, and it's a chocolate fudge one. And it's mm. two grams of fat, thirty grams of carbs, five grams of protein, and it tastes awesome. just like Ben and Jerry's. And it's cheaper. That's that's been my post workout slash Thing. pre bed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will. Yeah. Yeah. Um. The frozen yogurt thing is crazy. I, know. I, I usually have tend good. to really <laughs> not like frozen yogurt. I when I was actually seeing it, I was checking the macros and I was like, that can't be really good. Um, I was actually, I think I was doing my peak and like the Yorton Cup. There was the one peak we were really tried to implement, and I not really like um, actually try to, but I somewhat implemented stuff that I wouldn't eat normally, which was a was a bad decision in retrospective was just the first time in america and was my fourth peak yeah. week and i was just like um i will open with ben and jerry's half-baked <laughs> frozen yogurt <laughs> um and it's actually pretty 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 good um i don't know it's um, yeah it's, it's very good, good. if you, especially if you tend to be on the low fat side that's a great ice cream yeah. choice yeah and i tend to favor lower fat uh macros anyways yeah, and, it, and it doesn't it doesn't taste like halo top or any of the lower mm -hmm. calorie ice cream which halo top is ugh, that's not ice cream <laughs> or froyo yeah it's, yeah yeah i mean i i i um i can probably still eat halo top and be okay with it um probably not spending six euros on it that that's terrible no, no um, but i think i heard that the enlightened thing you you have even lower calories things than uh, i know halo i know top. i know I've yet to try that. 
I, I, I heard pretty very bad stuff about that. Really? That ice cream. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, I don't know. Never tried it, though. No. I think Skinny Cow's a good alternative on the lower fat side. Didn't try. Still expensive, though. But, yeah. 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 I, I actually tended to be... Um, at, at the end of prep, I was just like, screw, screw everything um, in terms of just, like, spending money on food. Yep. <laughs> like right now, I'm thinking much more if I actually buy the Ben & Jerry's or just a no-name brand that has probably the same macros taste. Somewhat, a little bit worse, e- little bit worse but yeah. <laughs> just gets gets the job done. So. Mm-hmm. I'm the same, um, yeah, same way. So do you tend to uh, actually, getting away from our ice cream discussion, <laughs> um, do, you, do you actually tend to have like fixed rates, rates of gains right now or do you just... Um, I'm going to most likely start next next week. One to two weeks from now, I'm going to start capping it because I'm right under the cuff of where I want to uh, hover around body weight-wise. I mean, I finally hit like 158, 159 pounds, which is where I want to stick around kind of and grow into. How much percent. pounds pounds are that over your stage weight? I just have to calculate the pounds from kgs because I know how, how <laughs> much you weighted in kgs, but like pounds, yeah. kind of like, uh, I have to calculate um, I'm not going to go with peak depleted weight because I don't consider that. Nah. I would, for worlds, I would say I was 146 pounds. Peaked? Peaked, yes. Fully peaked. Right now, uh, 158 pounds. And it's pretty much, I mean, I was a kg lighter and I'm probably right now a kg heavier. Kg, oh, okay. I probably look, I think it's six kg. Is it five kgs or is it six? I'm currently. I think uh, it's for, five. for me, it, it's currently uh, seven to eight. Seven to eight. Okay. Yeah. And that's. Um, I mean, that's right around where I. I had a feeling where I would feel good. So do you want to just stick there and stay there? Or? I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna stick around here for one to three months see how it looks if the weight fluctuates up and down so be uh so be it but as soon as uh gym progression does start dipping i will start being a little more meticulous in regards to food intake in my nutrition that's so kind of what i'm focusing on it. more so so you kind of actually want to quote unquote harden up the weight and yes. kind of like recomping a little bit at that body composition Yes. And from there on, you will start try to gain again, I guess. Uh, at some point. Yes, I, I'm waiting until the wedding, honestly, just due to suit fittings and not wanting to get fitted now no. and then have to make alterations in the <laughs> not future. Looking like so. Jay Cutler in his <laughs> peak yeah, off exactly. season, where he was just looking like obese. <laughs> yeah, because it. I, I don't want you know unnecessary weight to go to the you know sides or the shoulders. Mm. Well, they're gonna go to the shoulders, hopefully. Yeah, but I, 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 I want to look somewhat presentable on my wedding day, mm-hmm. as opposed to you know, a, a full chip I don't want to look full chipmunk cheek. Yeah, which tends to happen, but but then after after the wedding, May twenty third, I I do plan on rate of gain being anywhere from point two five to half percent of body weight per one to two weeks. Okay, very so, very very small. Rate so of gain. probably something. F- from 0.5 to 2 percent gain per month. Yes. Yes. Cool. Yeah, that's pretty much what I roll with again as well. Um, I'm currently on 2 percent, so kind of on a more aggressive side, and because yeah. I think I can still benefit from it right now in that state, but I will probably slow down again at some point. Agreed. And I think that's that's a uh, great rate of gain, especially since you are younger. Hmm. And I think you do have a lot. I think you have a lot more. Uh, muscular potential to gain being that you're yeah. younger and relatively newer yeah. to you know even training career wise hmm. and i'm still fully tracking so uh, right now <laughs> I, I noticed that i was actually trying to uh, my, my recovery diet macros were actually 3400 and i kind of reduced it to 3000 after those i think it was four weeks or five mm-hmm. weeks um i think i think it was four weeks uh, where i was actually feeling pretty fresh, pretty recovered. Um, but I uh, noticed that I went, that I just go over the 3000, like 
habitually by 100 to 200 so i can't really stick to them as good yeah um, yeah. So I just did the 2000, like uh, right now I tr I'm trying to intentionally hit like those 3200, 3300, um, because that's just intentionally actually putting something realistic out and maybe consume slightly more calories is probably better than setting something and you can't really adhere to it and then yes. you feel worse about it. Um, that yes. was kind of like my, my rationale. It's very similar to what I did, actually. I mean, I, I, it's not to say I did not track fully throughout the six weeks because there were days where I would, you know, punch into my fitness pill what I was eating. And I ended up, I've been tracking last few days. And like yourself, my, I, I noticed my recovery diet was around 4,000 calories. Protein was set relatively higher. It was around uh, 250 grams. Hmm. And then the majority of the calories did come from carbs since I do favor and tend to eat more lower fat. So it was around 60 grams of fat, 500 to 600 grams of carbs, 250 protein. Same, same for me. So I was pretty much sticking to my fats, um, just bumping proteins a little bit because I was kind of high anyways. And uh, that yes. just, I think it was like 530 or something carbs, 200, 200 to 220 protein and 55 fats yeah and then just having those like pretty broad ranges for me like plus, yeah, plus yeah. or minus 20 and plus or minus 10 yeah um and if i hit 70 grams of fat or 80 grams of fat i would yeah yeah may, no, i mean no. it happens yeah yeah i mean i was um i was probably eating out for one to two times per week and on those days i mean i was sticking to low fat foods throughout the day but if you eat like i don't know like a keep up or like a pizza or whatever and especially if you're a dessert person as me, um, same no then, same man. <laughs> yeah, um, then you then you go over your fats a little bit, and I yeah. now have up my fats to a little bit like five to ten grams, and I think I can just I, I don't had any problems, and I think I actually it was a positive post prep um, to actually kind of annually sticking to those macros at least in the ranges um, because with the lower fat approach i was sticking to mostly just like really carb dense foods that fill me up and um like um i couldn't fit that much ice cream into those macros so i had no, to yeah. yeah yeah um so that's probably a good thing so do you plan to implement any like structured mini cuts in the future in your pole improvement season until you actually prep again uh, or are you actually an <clears throat> advocate for mini cuts or what, what's your opinion on that or your experience? I think I'm going to go to the Nunez route and not, I, I might, it, it honestly depends how the lean gaining phase does go because I've never really successfully stuck to an actual lean gaining phase. I've always tried to, and then I end up pushing body weight too fast. Hmm. And then I, and, in which I should mini cut in order to continue gaining more optimally. I, I do think due to my age, I might, but I, I want to be at least one to a year and a half years removed from the stage before I do enter an actual calorie deficit do just to make sure everything's. Uh, do you have any plans to compete again? Like, do you think about this Not, specific year? Yeah. Um, bare minimum. I'm taking three years off. We, um, me and the fiance, actually, we're, we're going to get married, plan a family. So we want to, you know, have kids first, be, you know, acclimated to that hmm. before I start another prep. So, so 22? I'm, uh, 23. Cool. 2023, 20, 2024. Hmm. Bare minimum, though. Yeah. As, lo as long as it takes to get my arms from 13 inches to 15. <laughs> yeah, man, it's it's incredible how uh, on some band terms, like <clears throat> how small the actually measurement is to the look yep. of the of the arm. Yeah. Um, and same same with body weight, man. Same with body weight and body composition and just mm -hmm. look. It's crazy. And my my stage weight probably won't change the next time I do step on stage. So it's. That'll be fun. I, I, <laughs> it, I, I think it can be probably a little bit more. 
Um, if you take like three to four uh, years off, actually just be really methodology, methodical about your training nutrition, really hit like good chunks of training um, in those next three to five years, whatever. Um, I mean, I think conditioning wise, you could probably not get leaner. Um, that was I pretty do. much like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe slightly, maybe yeah, half a kg of fat, but I think you can gain way, more. Yeah, yeah, you can gain more muscle than half a kg in five yeah. years, um, especially with your training background that you didn't train that optimally to that point. Yep. Which is what is so exciting about the next, yeah. you know, two to four years of training. Yeah, that's, I think it's, it's almost like being a newbie again in the gym. Cool. Um, so coming actually to your training right now, um, I read that you do kind of like a frequency program, frequency experience, uh, kind of like um, um, Dr. Mike Usertel did and also Eric Helms did it throughout his prep. Um, like currently, how did you program your training um, post-show in terms of structuring your training variables? over the microcycle and what are your rationals behind those or behind the structure so I, I mainly drew inspiration from helms mendel Henselman, and dr mike in regards to how i did set up my uh uh one training frequency and how i you know selected movements so i have one i have six sessions currently throughout the week um five times per week bicep training frequency and four times per week side and rear delt frequency and then triceps are at three times per week frequency um so you train them on lower days um as well you basically yes. do full body right now correct yes i i mean this past week i actually recently brought my lower uh frequency down to one times per week just due to recovery and schedule issues um so five times per week, the biceps are getting hit. And then throughout the course, you know, um, of the four to five week block, I slowly would ramp up uh, set volume hmm. for the, uh, um, the arms and the delts that I was specializing. Just real quick, like a typical set progression for your, for your individual situation, obviously volume is super individual, um, mm -hmm. super uh, inter-individual and also inter-individual between uh, inter individual be uh, between muscle groups um, but what would like a typical brad freeman bicep progression from week one to week five uh tend to how would it uh, it's kind of hard to <laughs> just like just, just throw out some numbers i'm just throw out some numbers. i actually i mean i did post up the uh the per week set volumes like the uh the, how it uh increased throughout the course from weeks one to week cool. five it started off uh, 18, 23, 25, 27, 32. And then I kind of capped out there in regards to set volume. That's a pretty aggressive jump still. It was, it was a very aggressive jump. Um, the way I program, I mean, I was, I was progressing through load, through reps. Mm. Yeah. And uh, recovery was still good. I was still re getting mm. pumps in the, you know, during sessions. So my response yeah. to the training stimulus, it was, it was still there. Yeah, I, I, th I just think that probably over f like one to four sets at maximum is probably something that you should consider um, progressing towards uh, from week to week. Um, I, I tend to not program any four sets anymore, uh, but I have been in the past and it worked as well, especially with saying the things like biceps, rear delts, side delts, stuff like that. Um, and especially if you have such a high frequency. Uh, where you can actually split up the volume pretty evenly and um, uh, muscles like the biceps recover pretty fast. Very fast. And, uh, they at least tend to. So um, you can train them pretty frequently and if you do more bouts, you can do more absolute volume over the week. And that's, 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 that was the main reason I did do that because my, yeah. my, biceps, are, my biceps and triceps, they fatigue relatively quickly. So hmm. doing a... Uh, anywhere from a six to 12 set volume uh, session would load would decrease reps would decrease and the quality yeah, of work same. during that same. session would decrease. So what I am doing is like during the five times per week, it's anywhere from three to four sets per session. Mm -hmm. 
And then based on, you know, feedback from the training session for the next week, I might add a set or two and slowly drive volume up. Um, uh, like, um, even on the set, uh, set progression that you just told us, like, yes, yes. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so you're currently training lower only one times per week and then basically have like f five, one full body basic well, on the lower, you actually train your arms as well. Um, or yes, you just have a, like a pure lower session. It's a pure lower session with just oh, a cool. seated curl variation. Cool. Bicep, bicep curl variation yeah. and then the, the other days are um full full body or do you have any types of push pull or maybe even focused uh full body workers um day so session one is it's more it's pressing so it's it's more of a push with a mm -hmm. bicep movement with a side delt and then session two would be more pulling variation along with another bicep movement then mm -hmm. three is back to pushing And then session four is a the, the lower session with the added bicep training. And then session five is back to another push session. Cool. And you train six times per week? Um, yes. Uh, this, this week only uh, five sessions, but previous uh, seven weeks were six sessions per week. Did you train six times per week in your prep as well? Some days, yes. I mean, some weeks, yes, yeah. Okay, because I was immediately jumping back to five times per week because I couldn't stand training six times per week for. And that's I, what I'm. Yeah, that, that's what's hitting me now. It's like oh, six is way too much. Yeah. Like I'm just, it's not enough recovery. It's it's definitely not. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I mean, it is probably. <laughs> I mean, if you're recovering in gym and have progress in the gym, you are probably recovering. But just in terms yeah. of just being in the gym mentally so there. often, mentally, mentally being, it's you mentally, just get yeah. fatigued. I mean, I was training like the half half year of my improvement season pre prep six times per week, um, and then just throughout the whole prep. So pretty much one and a half years of just training six times per week. And it just gets so <laughs> mundane, like, and it's fuck that. It's just <laughs> not. Old. Yeah, it's like oh, another session. Oh, here we go. <laughs> That's why you, I recently this this week I'm like okay, we need to condense these six sessions into five. Okay. We're gonna. We're gonna make this, you know, this session. We're gonna combine these two, equate cool. volume and. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I will. Um, my my kind of plan is to creep up frequency as well over the last. Uh, I mean, I did it. Um, I started with a pull push lower upper lower, um, mm -hmm. five times per week frequency, and uh, now I switch to an upper lower upper rest upper lower rest. So basically, the same frequency of training bouts per week but with a slightly increased frequency in like just the upper body. And mm -hmm. I will probably after that will repeat it. Then I will do the maintenance phase and then I will be completely fresh again. And then I will start implementing training six times per week again. Yes. And I will probably, I mean, I'm not super sure about it. I will either stay to upper lower um, three times per week and have really short lower session because my lower body tends to be better than my upper body. And yeah. by keeping them shorter, I can actually be more mentally there and can also combine that with some upper training or we'll do some type of, I even thought of like a combination of two lower sessions and then a push pull session and then two upper sessions. Um, but it will get kind of interesting to actually program that throughout the microcycle to not mm -hmm. have the, the sessions like, um, Overlap. Interfe interfere with the, uh, each other. And I will yeah. probably at some point even do two times per week. Um, probably not in the beginning. So I will maybe even ramp up the frequency from meso to, uh, from meso, to meso slightly um, through, for example, training two times per day. Um, because my gym is really near for me. I, I just have like a five minute walk. So yeah. that will be possible. And I'm thinking about it, man. And because I I'm really interested. Some... Really interested. I'm really yeah, interested yeah. in two times. I've seen yeah. Steve, Steve Hall has made incredible progress training yeah, two Steve times training. He's just so uh, methodological. Method I don't know how, I can actually not pronounce it. <laughs> methodological, methodological, is that a word? Yeah, right. Um, about yeah. his approach and how he implements mini cards and just like gaining phases in between those mini cards, maintenance phase. And it worked out pretty well. Um, no, that did. The last two, two years, yeah, absolutely. Um, so It's very, very strategic and... I, 
super strategic I, I, yeah, pretty I, proactive I, I, also yeah but yeah works big great. Time. Um, and he, his pretty... work ethic is insane as yeah well. absolutely i love steve absolutely. yeah yeah great guy. um i i made some great gains with that approach as well i tend to be a little bit more reactive right now with just like implementing mini cuts maintenance phases um variation as well um, so in the past, I, I used to be pretty proactive about those things. And right now I'm kind of like, if we're actually good, we are kind of good. So we will keep rolling and then implement other stuff more reactively if we have to. Um, because in the end, it's super individual. And, uh, Definitely. That's, yeah. that's why I, I, I dislike when people do ask what I am doing because they want to copy and paste. Um, similar to Dr. Mike, like they, they want to know what Mike's doing. So mm. they're going to think that what Mike's doing will work for them. Whereas everybody's individual and depends what you're you know, specifically doing during that training phase, what you're trying yeah. to improve. Yeah. Um, it's all about learning the guidelines. principles and then yeah. just, yeah, implementing it to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And then just experiments, mm -hmm. experiment with it. Yeah. Um, because in your end, you are kind of like your own lab. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> your body's your own lab. Yeah. I mean, in, even in regards to like arm training frequency, I don't know if I really like training biceps five times per week because it, I like, I, I, I prefer, I prefer focusing on like two body parts. Mm. And again, it's, it depends on like the athlete psychology and how they, yeah. what makes them tick during training. Like what do they actually mm. enjoy? And yeah. 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 I think not that many people actually enjoy the super high frequency training. Like I couldn't uh, see myself training full body five times per week. No, just absolutely can't. not. Just can't. which I which I did try during prep to. Uh, it was too much overlapping and, and not not enough specificity during you know that training day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I had like my I actually switched from push pull or from pull push legs, pull push legs rest. I switched at some point to upper lower just three times per week. Um, because my lower sessions were just so long and so intense and so insane, I couldn't stand them anymore. I was literally, yeah. like literally my heart rate elevated when I was walking to the gym. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I was like, I woke up, I knew it was legs. The oh, day man. was like, I had some, I was, I was to a point where I was actually, when I was eating my pre-workout, I was actually getting nervous. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's a good. Th I mean, that's a, that's a good thing. Though. Nah, it was it, it was at some point it was kind of it was kind of um, it was to that point where I was actually have I I mean I I talked to a client about it and he had actually yeah. um, he had it in his improvement season that at his peak in for example a meso um, when he was eating his pre workout he had to put in more times be be between the pre workout and the actual workout because his digestion was slower than ah. usual because he was just more in a sympathetic state um, overall and also because of the session. I've um, experienced that too. That, I, it's, it's so interesting. Especially man. during like a heavy deadlift or a heavy squat day like yeah. in the past. I have definitely, yeah. or a bench session or just the, the thought and fear of like failing, you know, or not hitting your reps or not hitting the load or... Yeah, for me it was kind of like just a... Doing that while feeling super lethargic was kind of like, and just like the heavy compounds at the end, they just crushed yep. me. Like yep. the high was squat, I ditched it three weeks out, um, or like for the last meso um, for hex squats. Um, mm -hmm. I think it, it, it did well, it, it did my legs well, um, that I uh, have kept them in for that long. But at the end, it was crushing me. Like three <laughs> sets of squats, I w was literally like, hell. You had to talk to struggle. yourself to do that set. <laughs> That's, yeah. I, I completely, I mean, I can, I, I, I can relate. <laughs> I, I don't agree to training being war and people telling like, I will go to war <laughs> when I... But that was kind of feeling like it, man. Those squad sets were like, <laughs> it, it, that's just insane. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, um, I would try to equate volume instead of like chasing load. I'd be like, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're going to actually, we're going to load up, you know, say I'm Smith squatting or hex squatting. It's like, you know, hmm. you're going to load it up with like similar off-season weight and you're going to rep it out because you can, even though you're deep in a prep. Like, 
Um, do you actually quit have? Being a... <laughs> do, do you have actually? Um, do you actually? Because I, I talked to a client about it recently, who was also doing prep uh, in 2019. Uh, do you have like some exercises that you did your whole prep long that you currently just can't do, can't stand any because you're just mentally you just hate the exercise? <laughs> I had that with Smith squats, man. I can Smith probably squats. not Smith, Smith squat for for the next few months. They just. I see a smooth squat. I will. I see a smooth machine. I will not squat in there in the next few months. Not at funny, all. Funny you say that because I, I ended up having to. I, I went to my other gym last week, but they were closed due to New Year's, and I had to train at the one down the street. And they only had a Smith squat machine, and I had hack squats programmed. I'm mm -hmm. like, God damn it! And so I got under the bar, and I just had prep flashbacks. I'm like, I nope, nope. I do not miss this. I do not. Yeah. yeah. It's super worse with lower body exercises. I mean, yeah, yeah. I was debating if I want to keep my RDL in because I was RDLing the pretty much all prep. I did deadlifts in, in the beginning, but I did them after two mesos because they were just like screwing me up. Leverage wise. They, yeah. they were pretty much screwing me up the whole time. I just did them in my improvement season as well. And they did me some good gains, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But in prep, I just the rational, just the stimulus fatigue ratios just were too worse. They're, they're awful. And yeah. The RDL was probably the hardest lift at the end um like when i ditched the the high bar squat for the smith uh, for the for the um, hex squat the hex squat was kind of fine like a reverse band hex squat and dust gym in the last mesocycle was actually kind of fun even was it? <laughs> yeah it was like i remember the first session i had those like anxiety things that i usually had when i uh, knew i would have to uh, train lower um, but it was the first time not doing high bar squats for like the whole prep and I did reverse band hex squats and it was kind of fun oh, and I can actually, I can actually push myself really far in that exercise. I can, mm -hmm. like if I want to, I can hit like a real zero rep in reserve, um, which on a high bar squat is kind of, I mean, you can have like a technical, uh, zero Mechan reps in yeah. reserve. Uh, yeah. But like real concentric failure, zero reps in reserve on a high bar squat, that will not happen to me because uh, at, at some point I would just have like a half good morning squat and then you can still do reps. <laughs> you'll re -rack it. Yeah, you can you'll... still do reps, but it's, it's like a technical failure thing. Yeah. Um, and in a movement where you're actually fixed, you can push yourself much further. Um, you can grind more reps out, I, I feel like, with a hack squat or even a Smith machine squat, I've noticed. Yeah. 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 I actually, I'm the one, my favorite movement while dieting, funny enough, are sumo deadlifts. I don't know why. For some odd reason, it's the sumo deadlift. I don't care much for RDLs. Like, like yourself, like they just, they hurt when you're lower body fat and deep in the prep. You yeah, just feel I, the hamstrings almost You just tearing. feel just so tearing. Yeah. And it, you feel so, eh, it's a bad feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> At the end, basically everything heavy compound everything hurts. related. Yeah. 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 Nothing feels Especially good. <laughs> Prep is fun. Um, so yeah. Cool. <laughs> so you, you're rational about the higher frequencies just to get more quality volume in? Quality volume, yes. Cool. And I will most and likely return to two to three times per week frequency in the future after yeah, I, I, mean, I run I think, this course. Yeah, I think frequency you can really do it strategically um, over specific time periods. Um, for example, after the maintenance phase, I would probably not train for, I would probably train half a year for six times per week and then I will get back to something like more five times per week and maybe, yeah, um, yeah and also you can probably not train six, um, maybe do a maintenance phase in between again um, to kind of resensitize and also just mentally to get fresh again. And that mm -hmm. will be kind of like my second to last question, like. Do you, yeah, I mean, we are all, uh, already touched on that, um, but do you plan to implement any lower volume phase? I do, yes. M mainly to resensitize and also I'm going to use the lower volume periods for uh, strength blocks. Mm -hmm. Cool. Just yeah, me too. Because there's... I, Gives well, you I, a little bit more motivation. Yeah, more motivation, more... Uh, there, there's just something different about chasing load as opposed to uh chasing not necessarily volume but training more you know zero to three reps on reserve as opposed to leaving you know reps in the tank while accumulating volume 
and I also during the lower volume phases, I am going to cycle back in powerlifting movements. So I'm gonna, I'm going to actually get back under free bar squats, uh, hmm. conventional slash sumo deadlifts, and then finally return to bench pressing during the low the lower volume periods. Um, and what what you what's your rationale behind it? Uh, basically, mental mentally. It's yeah. It's more so. It's more so for uh, the mental aspect mm. of it. There's, it's it's just a different adrenaline rush feeling when you are under a heavy a heavier load, and you know hitting a triple or hitting you know five reps as opposed to, you know, eight to fifteen, which I have been hitting recently. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Um, did you actually had some? Um, you, you told us that you had some uh, motivation pro or not motivation problems, but the motivation to train post prep wasn't as high. And I think to get it back, it, the maintenance phase will do you good. Um, oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. I tend to just observe the clients and also the the ones that I did in the past. After those like four weeks of low volume training, you will you You're like burn. Itching, they get back you, in burn to get back in and yep. yeah i actually had my first structured deload during the chris you know the christmas break holiday and mm. it was the first time ever i had properly planned a deload and i was i think it was day three or day four and i was just itching to get back in it was a nice feeling because yeah, you know healthy. by the yeah. end of that mesocycle like i was pretty heavily fatigued sleep was bad but then three four days in Itching to get back in. How's your motivation nice to train reset. lower? How's your motivation yep. <laughs> to train lower right now? Yes. <laughs> you you only have one lower session, right? Uh yes. Yes. How's the volume and they're not they're not that? even what is the volume work? It's yeah, what what is the volume on that lower? Laughable. It's <laughs> um it's a hack squat, so it's um six sets for quads and six for hams and four for calves. So Nothing. basically, one of my two uh, low yeah. sessions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I I um, was even thinking about it, but I also think that my lower body. I mean, even it's a strong point, but in my training, my point in, the, in my training career, I can probably still push my strong points and not be oh, super yeah. and, and unbalanced. And I would, yeah. and I would recommend yeah. doing that. Yeah. I mean, I might do the same. See how yeah. big I can actually get the legs since I've been maintaining them forever. So. Yeah, it would be interesting to see that. Cool. Um, yeah. Kind of like my last question for you is, uh, since you coach yourself again, I guess. Um, yes. Is there anything particular? Do you actually do self check-ins, or how do you assess yourself? Like, um, how's your like kind of like self coaching process? I'm just interested. It's actually really similar to how Cliff does his own check-ins. I don't necessarily, I don't send myself an email, but I do, when I was prepping myself or when I do prep myself, I do sit down after a week's check-in picks and I will compare them to the last. And then I will compare my weigh-ins, you know, compare my, mm. um, my steps, cool. my cardio and everything and kind of assess where to go after that week, which is incredibly easy, you know, from the, the, for the first six, the first six months of dieting is really easy doing that yourself. But then, you know, when decision fatigue starts setting in, lethargy, and then you start debating yourself and what should I do next? Or should I add a cardio? Should I add more cardio? Should I increase my steps? Hmm. Should I? It, it just becomes incredibly difficult. Yeah. You just ca noticed. can't really, can't really be that objective anymore. Yeah. Um, it was c kind of the same for me. I was pretty, like all the decisions that my coach made, we kind of made together kind of. Um, yeah, yeah. and we <clears throat> had a little bit back and forth sometimes, but usually we tend to agree and I could probably coach myself until four weeks out and then I lost it just like on the mental side, just like I was getting pretty subjective about my physique. I, I remember I, I, I had a check-in and there was actually the photos, the best check-in photos that I have from my prep. Um, And I remember on that particular day, I was like, fuck it, I don't look good. <laughs> and right now I look at those photos and I'm actually pretty proud about those. So, um, And I was the same exact with Cliff. I would send him pictures. I'd be like, I kind of look like shit today. And 
he, yeah. he, he, would, he would be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but it's so but, funny looking back on it. Yeah. It's like, oh, wow, you were, you know, during that, you, state, your state of mind, your state of mind is so clouded when you are yeah. dieting. That... <laughs> yeah, man. And uh, I it's... remember Valentin just told, just told me back in the days, he was like, wait, uh, wait after, like, wait a little bit after the prep, you will look at those photos and you can't believe how lean you actually were, so... And it's like right, it's right around, the, yeah, it's right around this time where it's like you're looking back and it's like, oh, I, I did look really good, pretty good. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's so cool, fun. Brad. Um, I really enjoyed our discussion. I know you're uh, a little bit time constricted, and I also want to give you the opportunity to, yeah, plug your stuff, plug your Instagram, um, like your social media, so people can actually find you that don't know you yet and consume your content. Um, so where do people uh, can find you? Um, Instagram backslash bathtub. That's really the only place that I'm at currently. Cool. Uh, is, that, is that actually a nickname <laughs> or whatever? Is this the bathtub thing? It's Yeah, it's uh, actually, uh, I think Adam McDonald asked me about that. Um, it's my first three initials. And then I used to always take pictures in a bathroom setting. So when I was making a forum name on the bodybuilding.com forums like 10 years ago, I'm like, oh, bath, bathtub. And that's been it ever since. <laughs> cool. Stay, yeah. stay OG. Stay OG. <laughs> cool, Brad. Feels, um, yeah. Thank you again for coming on. And, thank you for having uh, me. Yeah, hopefully see each other uh, again in the near future. Oh, definitely. We'll see you at Worlds. Yeah. It'll be on the flip side, though. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Ha have a great day, man. You as well. Thank you for having me on.